Josh, come on up. Josh Benton is the director of Neiman Lab. Neiman Lab covers innovation in journalism. That's its reason for being. Uh, Josh is one of the most informed observers of the digital journalism landscape in the US, maybe the most informed. And that's why I started asking him several years ago to uh, put together a slideshow of the key developments in innovation in journalism over the past year. And since we're coming to the end of this year, it's the perfect time to do that. So, Josh. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, this is my fourth time giving this talk, and for the last three times I've asked myself whether to tell the story, whether it's TMI, but I'll tell it anyway. I think Jay knows what's coming. Um, the very first time that Jay invited me down here for, to give this talk, he said, you know what, make it a family event. Bring your wife down. So my wife came and had a wonderful time watching all the presentations from that class of Studio 20 students. Um, you know, talk about the future of news just does something to people. And uh, we went back to our hotel, and soon enough, there was a new addition to our family who was spawned <laughs> directly from this event. <laughs> and I think if we're talking about innovation, I mean, the original innovation, really. Um, so every year, I show a photo of, of, of Jay Rosen Benton. No, I'm Dashiell Benton. <laughs> So this was Dash after year one. This was, I have three months of age. Nine plus three adds up to a year, you know. This is a year later, uh, Halloween. And this is him getting a haircut a couple weeks ago. So Dash sends his best and also prevents my wife from likely ever coming back here since <laughs> if I'm out of here, Dash is busy sleeping one hopes right now. Um, all right. Uh, to the year in innovation, I'm going to try to make this a relatively quick tour, so I, I may be going a little bit fast on some things. I hope you'll, you'll forgive me for that. Um, I've gone through a variety of, of things that were of interest to us at Neiman Lab over the past year, grouped them into a few subheadings, and let's get started. So number one, our gentle Northern California overlords, the very small number of technology companies located between San Jose and San Francisco who increasingly control everything about the, the sharing of information. Um, this to me was, was one slide that summed up a lot about the year. This was at Facebook's F8 conference, which is its annual developer conference. And this is what Mark Zuckerberg presented as the roadmap for the future. So you see on the left, we have Facebook, the original product, Facebook. Next to it, you have a, a, a cohort of products, including WhatsApp and Instagram and Messenger that are all very important to Facebook's future growth. And then on the right, you get the future. You can see at the bottom, VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality, mobile VR, the Oculus Rift. Up above there, you see artificial intelligence, uh, machine vision, machine language, uh, machine learning. Uh, at the top, satellites. Remember, Facebook now has satellites. They, you know, or, or did, I think it exploded on the, on the tarmac, if I remember correctly. Um, they have these planes that are like soaring over Africa. If you've flown an American Airlines flight lately, there's a nice ad for it. Uh, 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 on the on the, what they show you on the video screens. And the one item on there that frankly terrifies me because Zuckerberg did not address it at all and his address is at the very top right, which is lasers. We don't really know. <laughs> we don't know what the lasers are all about. So I'm hoping that we get some clarity on that in 2017 and that the clarity is, is not earth threatening. Um, but in a real sense, this was Facebook's year. Um, this was from a New York Times story in the year, noting that uh, data shows that the average American spends 50 minutes each day using Facebook products. 50 minutes every day. Think about the things that you do for 50 minutes a day. If you're like me, there's sleeping, there's eating, and that's, that may be it. I guess reading Twitter, that's, that's probably for, for me, but maybe not for normal people. Um, it, you know, we, we, Facebook has reached the scale where prime ministers of Scandinavian countries have to get involved when they decide to take down historically significant photographs, such as this photo from, from Vietnam, when a Norwegian newspaper, Afton Post, and decided to post it on Facebook and it was taken down as child pornography. You know, the prime minister is getting involved because it is such an, an amazing, you know, an, an amazing amplifier of information or an amazing choke point for information, depending on how, to, how you want to look at it. This chart in some ways sums up 2016 for me. This is data from early in the year, but this is uh, for sites that use Parsley, which is a common analytics platform used by a lot of news organizations. Where do they get their external traffic from? 
you'll see there are basically two answers to that question, Facebook and Google. They've essentially formed a duopoly that uh, controls an enormous share of American attention and, and global attention. In the first quarter of 2016, 85 cents of every new dollar spent in online advertising goes to Google or Facebook. They are, those two are literally eating the world. Uh, and that's led to questions like this. This is one of my, my favorite tweets of the, of the year, even though only three people retweeted it. The presentation uh, wasn't my tweet, so I don't have to claim any pride of, pride of ownership there. But uh, CEO of IDG, the publishing firm, saying, does digital advertising even work? Right, the story that we've been telling ourselves about print advertising shifting to digital advertising or broadcast advertising shifting to, to digital advertising, fundamentally digital advertising has been captured by two companies. You know, if you go back to that chart, third place, Yahoo. Poor sad Yahoo. This was probably before, we, well this was before we knew about a billion accounts being stolen. Um, so in a very fundamental way, uh, 2015 was the year of distributed content. It was the year that Facebook Instant Articles were, were, were first introduced, and the idea of a news organization not just producing a website, but publishing directly onto the platforms that have monopolized so much of human attention. Uh, this year, we saw the final launch of AMP, Google Accelerated Mobile Pages Project, which uh, if you've ever noticed, uh, and you click, go search for something on your phone, and then you see an unusual carousel, and you tap on it, then it loads, and it looks kind of like a vaguely stripped down, vaguely broken web page, but it loads very quickly. That's Google AMP. Um, this chart, to me, is, uh, is a sign of the difference between 2015 and 2016. These are, this is data from The Verge, which is a Vox Media site that covers technology. Among other things, they'll tell you it's much more about culture and cars and things, but it's a technology site. Um, the, uh, the things you tell advertisers. Um, you'll see on the, these, are, these are all the ways that people see Verge content across various platforms. In 2015, you see the dominant source is website page views, this old fashioned thing where you go to a website and you read an article. In 2016, you see that actually website page views have shrunk. It is a smaller number, which is not something that they would want to tell our investors. But you can see that it, the reason why it has shrunk in part is because there are so many other places that people are seeing Verge content. This is a site that has thoroughly committed itself to being distributed across platforms. You'll see the, the blue bar, the darker blue bar there is, is AMP. That's a, uh, the, the Google speedy mobile view project. But you'll also see Flipboard flips, Apple News views, YouTube video views, Facebook video views, they have their own special Facebook only brand called our Facebook focus brand called Circuit Breaker, Instagram views on video, Twitter video views, tiny amount of podcast listens and news, newsletter opens, that makes me a little sad. But you can see how in terms of what The Verge controls or owns, it's a relatively small part of the overall pie. And one thing that happened this year was a real shift of video in particular out to the platforms. The Verge redesigned on its fifth anniversary last month, and you'll see they have a, you know, section headings, tech, science, culture, cars, reviews, long form, and then video. You might think, and it was the case before, and it's still the case on just about every other news site, that the video page will go to something like theverge.com slash video, and it'll show you videos in their own native player because they can sell ads at a higher rate on their own native player on their own site. But actually, that's just a link to their YouTube channel. Essentially, they've realized video is, be is not being viewed on our website. It's being viewed on YouTube, and it's being viewed on Facebook, and we might as well go roll with it. Again, Google and Facebook own everything. Um, when you think about Google and Facebook, and you think, who's going to be the challenger to come up and be the, the next generation competitor? Um, who's going to be the, I was going to make a boxing metaphor, but I remember who actually followed that. I don't think Sphinx really counts. Um, Snapchat is probably the, the strongest possibility. Snapchat Discover is another major distributed platform that's been around a little bit over a year, but they showed this year by slight tweaks in the way that uh, Snapchat Discover appears, that sto stories from news organizations appear, that they can have massive influences on the amount of traffic that go to individual news sites. So not only are they convincing these news sites, you need to create special custom content just for our users, but they still reserve the right to just change it however they want. They can send views plummeting or, or scoring whenever they want. 
One final development in the sort of technology-centered section of this is that this was really the year that stories became a format. You know, Snapchat stories were a remarkable innovation, had a huge amount of uh, influence among the mostly younger user base that Snapchat has. But it, the idea of, of the story, of course, was stolen by Instagram with Instagram stories this year. And you're seeing the DNA of it spread throughout the ecosystem. The outline, uh, Joshua Topolsky's uh, very interesting site, which just launched a few days ago, certainly takes some design DNA from this stories format. So it seems to be another way that we've, uh, we've decided is going to be a persistent format for news online. All right, video. Video is still a huge deal. It's a bigger and bigger deal, and news still doesn't really know how to deal with it. Um, another thing that sort of became a format this year, as we heard from our previous presentation, was that live became a format. I mean, of course, we know about Facebook Live, which launched in April. But Instagram Live is on the way, available on some of your phones right now, perhaps, if you're in, the, uh, in a certain part of the rollout. You'll be able to go live from Instagram. Twitter just integrated uh, Periscope Live broadcasting directly into the Twitter app uh, this a uh, couple days ago. There's a weird sense in which social, social platforms which have tried to differentiate themselves are sort of becoming shapeless vessels for everything to just sort of be copied and shoved in the same way that every tech company has to have a $10 a month music platform. Not because they really want to, but because it's sort of table stakes. I think live is, is sort of becoming that. Um, who watched this live? Does anyone? Okay. Right. This is my crowd. I get it. Um, uh, so this was... Uh, a remarkable moment in, in uh, televised video history. On a Friday afternoon when not much was going on, BuzzFeed decided, hey, we have this watermelon. Hey, we have a bunch of rubber bands. Let's put the rubber bands around the watermelon one by one, broadcast it live to an audience of people who are bored at work and should be doing their, their, their proper to-do list and see what happens. And it was a 45-minute long video. Uh, it was viewed by, at, at its peak by more people than, anyone, than any television show airing in America at that time. 11 million people watch this. <laughs> so if you want to, I would say, you know, you could tell you it's around rubber band 800 where it happens. But you could just see it's a 45-minute long video. Go to about 4430. You're, you're, you're probably going to get it. <laughs> Facebook, of course, was very, is very interested in Facebook Live as a platform, so they are paying outlets like BuzzFeed and like the New York Times to do a lot of Facebook Live video. This is a, a Times video that I thought was a kind of remarkable moment. The, the Times, I would argue, uh, in the early days, were, were intentionally trying to be kind of rough and try new things with Facebook Live. Uh, some of them didn't work very well. This was a, a reporter uh, at, a, uh, at a pitch meeting talking about a story he was working on. If you go and watch this video, he's saying things like, well, we don't have this confirmed yet, but we think X, Y, and Z. It was not maybe the, a well-thought-out plan. <laughs> but I will say the New York Times has really upped its Facebook Live game and does a lot of really, really good work now. Um, this was one of the more remarkable ones. Does anyone know what ASMR is? Right? What does it stand for? I actually don't remember what it stands for. Autosensory... Or, thank you. Um, it's this thing that's vaguely a medical phenomenon, vaguely a sexual fetish, in which people really respond to women whispering over YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> Google it. You'll be fine. Um, BuzzFeed decided to do, I, I wish I had time to broadcast it, but just Google this and see BuzzFeed actually would do a daily newscast for a time that was just a woman whispering very slowly <laughs> and quietly about how wonderful it is that Mexico is considering a change in its trade policy. <laughs> um, so in a, in a very real sense, Facebook Live has been a, a, a palette for, for, for uh, experimentation on a, on a form we haven't really seen before. Um, so with video, television uh, time is shrinking uh, for, for young people in particular. This is 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, you can see that in the span of about six years, you're going from around 250 minutes of television watching per day to around 150 minutes. That's a pretty substantial change. Um, and uh, you may have had some, have some sort of memory in the back of your brain about of this, this uh, appearance by a Facebook executive at a conference in which she says that Facebook will be all, the, the news feed will be all video in five years. Basically, text is on the way out. All you people who know how to hold a pen are just wasting your time. You're basically the new Amish. And, <laughs> and it's all video from here. I could have actually shown the quote, like a screenshot of the text, but I decided it would be, I'd just show you a video of her, and you would not be able to scan it or get any information from it. So um, 
The problem with this is that news is not moving to video at anywhere near the pace that everything else is moving to video. And this is a potentially troubling phenomenon because just about every major news company is investing an enormous amount in, vi in video and they're not seeing particularly good returns for the most part, at least on their news content. Um, this was a report that came out uh, this uh, earlier this year from the Reuters Institute at Oxford that looked at uh, a, a large set of news sites across a number of countries and looked at art, do pages that have video, uh, videos on them, article pages that have videos on them, do they perform better than pages that do not, that are just plain old, old-fashioned Pennsylvania Dutch text? And the answer is videos perform substantially worse than text. Uh, in the sample set that they looked at, a, very, uh, a large sample set, 6.5% uh, of the pages had video, but only 2.5% of total time spent was spent on the pages that have video. Um, and even for video, or for outlets that had substantial video successes, even serious outlets, it turns out that the top things are still puppies. <laughs> Maybe not shocking to those of you who have, who have been to the internet at any point in the past. Um, and the, this is an interesting Pew study that came out earlier this year that said that younger people are more likely than older people to prefer reading news. Older people choose watching. Younger people prefer reading. Um, I, I saw after the election there are num uh, in the any number of uh, examples of people trying to you know have their own personal divining rod for why what happened happened. And one of the answers is well we've moved to we're now in a post text society. You know we've lost we've returned to an age of orality. We've gone beyond textuality. Do these people remember television? Television you know shifting from television to reading things on your phone is not moving away from text. It's it's moving towards it. Anyway, rant over. New platforms. <laughs> Uh, when I say new platforms, I essentially mean what's going to come after this platform. We know who wins on this platform. We know that it's Google. We know that it's Apple. We know that it's Facebook. It's a very small set of technology companies. What are the new platforms going to be that might have a chance for a new set of winners? I just move through my notes. So, sorry. <laughs> so one example here is is uh, texting. Texting and chatting more broadly has been a big area of emphasis. Purple is a, a, a startup that uh, was doing a text message-based transmission of information, particularly around politics. They, like uh, you might expect from everything I've said so far, decided in the middle of the year, let's abandon the open platform of SMS texting and become a Facebook messenger system because that's what one does. But nonetheless, you heard lots of news and information around chatbots, particularly in Facebook, but also in other platforms. Our friends at Quartz created uh, the first news app that is built around a texting metaphor, which is incredibly creative. Just was named one of the top ten Apple uh, apps of the iPhone apps of the year by Apple. Um, is a, is a very different experience. If you haven't downloaded it, you definitely should and check it out because it is sort of news as a conversational, entertainment-based experience as opposed to the sort of hunting and seeking that comes from traditional news consumption. That said, most Facebook Messenger bots have been flops. Uh, wearables. So last year, the Apple Watch came out. We came out with a new Apple Watch this year. Um, for the most part, kind of boring. Nothing too exciting going on there. A lot of the optimism that came around it uh, came out about it last year as, an, as a news platform has, has been dulled. This year, all about Snapchat spectacles. Now, Snapchat spectacles, you may you know, the idea is not that dissimilar in some ways from Google Glass. Um, Snapchat, way better marketers than Google. You, so look at this message, this visual image, and this is how Google decided to market <laughs> Google Glass. Also this. <laughs> These are the two images most associated with the earth-changing platform. And uh, that's why there are lines to, you know, lines around the block to pick up a pair of spectacles, but not quite for, for Google Glass. There are a variety of other reasons as well. Snapchat is a much more youthful facing uh, platform and there are a lot of really well-designed uh, elements of it. It's gotten great reviews. Um, beyond that and beyond that, <laughs> we do have VR, or as I like to call it, people holding up cardboard to their face. Um, it uh, is another platform. We've heard a lot about, about it before. I will main, maintain my overall VR skepticism for news. Um, I'm more than willing to have you quote that back in my face in five years when we are meeting in some sort of strange virtual reality and I'm waving at you through some sort of cloud. Um, 
But uh, virtual reality, I, I tend to think, is going to be driven by gaming. It's going to be driven by Hollywood. It's going to be driven by platforms where it makes a lot more sense. And news is going to sort of be carried along as like the ninth class citizen on whatever platform uh, comes along. An area that people have been, news organizations are a little bit more optimistic about and doesn't cost quite as much to invest uh, in building is the Amazon Echo. And it's, it's sort of the leader in the, this class of voice-driven interfaces. Google Home came out this year. Uh, Siri arrived on the desktop. And we all think that Apple has some more plans for for her, because of course all assistants have to be anthropomorphic women. Um, but uh, there are lots of news organizations who are very interested in the idea of having a, a foothold in the home, in a stationary device that can become a part of a daily routine, something that newspapers and television used to have a, a pretty key area in, uh, in holding. And it hasn't even been officially released yet, although it did finally go on sale, I think, yesterday or the day before, Apple's Air EarPods, AirPods, AirPods, yes. Um, it's devices that sort of look like headphones with the wires cut off. Um, I only mention them because uh, I think there's some reason to believe that there is a distant future, still a couple years out, where these ear computers could become an interesting wearable device if Apple can afford it, can somehow make it not seem like the least cool thing in the world to, to have on your face. Um, <laughs> We'll see how they, how they survive that struggle. But the idea of an assistant that knows your location, is connected to all the intelligence on your phone, can whisper things to you as opposed to Amazon Echo, which involves yelling at a, at a, at a cylinder that you know, lives in your kitchen. Um, I think there's some interesting potential there if Apple decides to go in that direction. All right, who else is having a good year? Rich people. <laughs> Rich people for the roughly 2,000 consecutive year. Good year for rich people. Um, probably more than that. I think BC, the Roman Empire, was pretty good for rich people too. Um, there's been a trend that makes an enormous amount of sense from a business perspective, but nonetheless angers me deeply, which is that all, a lot of investment in new news products is saying, you know what? People who are interested in news, they are a niche. It's sort of the logical conclusion to the idea that mass media has been killed by the internet. Well, maybe the mass doesn't care about news, so we're going to create products that have a very high price point that are targeted at people who want to learn and have information and have a lot of money to spend on it. So the information, the information is a, a very good site that I, I subscribe to because I can expense it to Harvard. Um, $400 a year, um, roughly two stories a day about events going on in Silicon Valley. They are very well reported stories. They have very talented reporters. And uh, there are a lot of people in, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere for whom the kind of really detailed, high value information they provide is worth $400 a year. This year they decided, well, there's, there's still some, some ceiling above that. So they decided to announce a new premium tier that is $10,000 a year where they will allow you to be on conference calls with their reporters and have sort of a personal insight into the things that their reporters are learning. Axios, which sounds like the bad guys in a Die Hard movie, is in fact the startup from a variety of Politico uh, leaders who uh, left that company. Having seen the success of Politico Pro, the, 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 the quite successful product there where you can, if you're really interested in agriculture policy, you can spend thousands of dollars a year to have text messages sent to your BlackBerry whenever a subcommittee takes a vote on, on some small bill. Um, Axios is uh, still in development and we'll see what, what they produce. They'll have a, a free component, but the, the head of it uh, recently at a conference said, I'm only interested really in subscriptions that are at a $10,000 a year level. Uh, my friend Nick Kwa, oh, I should say, uh, John Slade, who is, the, I believe, the chief commercial officer at the FT. Uh, we are, I should say, at Neiman Lab this year, we, uh, and every year, we run a, a grand old package at the end of the year called Predictions for Journalism in the Next Year. I hope you'll all go check it out at NeimanLab.org because it's all I've been doing for the last week. But uh, John Slade uh, published this, or wrote this for us uh, just yesterday saying that you know, the Financial Times has always sought a premium audience, but they are seeking a super premium audience, just as the Wall Street Journal has always had a premium audience, and through Pro and other products is, is doing that as well. Again, this makes an enormous amount of business sense. Why not lean into information or into income inequality and sort of add on information inequality while you're at it? 
my, my friend Nick Kwa had a, a piece uh, just uh, yesterday in which he said, like, that you really think of, of tiers of intelligence, information, news, and content, and you price accordingly. And I think that is a, a system that makes, again, a lot of sense financially. Makes me sad. Um, people who don't have a lot of money live in local communities. They are still screwed. The decline of newspapers is accelerating. So if you, if you look at a chart of newspaper print advertising income, you'll see that it went up for a long time at a relatively steady rate, fell off the dot-com crash, fell again starting in 2006, fell quite dramatically during the financial crisis, but has been falling for the last five years or so, mostly at a 6% rate, 7%, 8% rate, varies by, by, by company, but usually in the mid to high single digits. Um, this year, we saw that really accelerate. I show this slide, I think, just about every year because there's a new version of it every year. But this is a slide from Mary Meeker, who's a noted analyst of, of the internet, works at uh, Kleiner Perkins, the, the hedge fund company, and, uh, or the venture capital company, excuse me. Uh, this, she's looking at five forms of media, print, radio, television, internet, and mobile. So internet here is desktop internet. And you can see in the two bars, the left bar is what percentage of Americans' media consumption time is spent in that media, that form of media. So, Television, 36% of our media consumption time in the United States is spent watching television. The blue, or aqua, she changed her color scheme this year, aqua bar is what percentage of the ad dollars in the United States go to that form of media. So you see with television, they're roughly equal. You can see with the desktop internet now, they're roughly equal. They weren't for a very long time. Mobile still has a lot of ground to catch up. We spend a lot more time looking at our phones than advertisers spend money selling us things on our phones. And then poor print over here. Still get 16% of ad dollars, but only 4% of our attention. And you can look at these numbers over the past decade and have been seeing both those columns shrink, but also the gap between them shrinking. So in other words, print has a long way to go down. Uh, and we started to see that this year. This is how much print advertising dropped at some major chains in the third quarter of this year. McClatchy down 16%, the New York Times Company 14%, Gannett 10%. If you look internationally, Trinity Mirror in the UK, 21%. Post Media, the largest chain in Canada, 19%. I don't have any optimism that this is going to slow down. I think this is, this is an accelerated decline. I don't see it changing or stopping. I have the obligatory slide showing that a lot of fewer people work in newspapers than they used to. I can give you a 2015 number because this is the last number because as in so many newspaper stats, at a certain point it becomes depressing and the, num the institution that is issuing it decides they're not gonna issue it anymore. I think one of the key questions for 2017, one that I'm gonna be very interested in, is what happens when newspapers stop shrinking and they just start closing, right? If you go back and watch page one, the very good documentary from 2011, I think it came out around taped in 2009, 2010, there was enormous fear that newspapers were going to start closing in large numbers. The Rocky Mountain News had closed in Denver, the Seattle Post Intelligencer had closed, and there was a fear that you're going to start to see really large levels of closures. That hasn't happened. What's happened instead is that newspapers just shrink a little bit more every day, every year, and become a little bit worse every year because they don't have as many reporters and as many resources. What happens when that changes? We had an interesting example of that this year at the Tampa Tribune. The Tampa Tribune was not known as a great newspaper. It was a fine newspaper. I think they won a Pulitzer once. But they always lived in the shadow of what was then the St. Petersburg Times, which was a great newspaper and is a great newspaper and did a lot of great work and, you know, was terrific. Um, the Tampa Tribune uh, is, in some ways, can be viewed as another story like the Rocky Mountain News, a two-newspaper news, two newspaper city becoming a one-newspaper city. That's been a story in the United States for, you know, the better part of a century. Um, but you can also view it as, as the beginning of a new kind of closure. Uh, the Tampa Tribune was sold in 2012 to a private equity firm called Revolution Capital. It was sold for $9.5 million. Now, I do not have anywhere near $9.5 million, but $9.5 million is not a lot of money to buy a major metro newspaper, right? That's, that's, uh, that was a bargain price. Uh, in the next four years, they cut the company from 618 employees to 265 employees. They identified a, what the newspaper's core asset was, which was the land that its headquarters were sitting on in Tampa, and sold the land for $17.7 .7 million. Remember, they bought the whole operation for nine. And then, having sold the land, cut the, news, the staff in more than half, 
and essentially just you know, milked it for all the money that the cash flow it possibly could. It then decided to sell it off to the Crosstown paper and just shut it down with no notice, no, no final edition for everyone to rally around. Um, on one hand, this is two newspaper towns going to one newspaper towns. On the other hand, this is also an example of what happens when you have a new kind of newspaper owner who has no particular attachment to newspapering. Doesn't even, you know, they, the complaints used to be about chains like Gannett and Knight Ritter coming and buying up independent ownerships. But at least Gannett and Knight Ritter, those are newspaper companies. A lot of newspapers are now owned by things that are not newspaper companies and have no such attachment. We also saw this in the Bay Area. There used to be a paper called the Contra Costa Times. There used to be a paper called the Oakland Tribune. They don't exist anymore. There's now a paper called the East Bay Tribune, which is a merger of these two and one other newspaper. Um, in a sense, we're seeing the closure of newspapers without even seeing them as the closure of newspapers. This year we had Tronk. <laughs> Supply your own jokes. Um, here, let me hit one more arrow so you can see how machine learning transforms <laughs> reading habits into high engagement. But what the the Tronk episode was, was unfortunate on a, num a large number of levels because Tronk owns some great newspapers, the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, others. Um, and the, re the real unfortunate thing is that there are only a few companies left that have any interest in buying up the newspapers that might want to sell. And that is one of them. And what I said before about we're not, we might not even be sure when newspapers start to go away, I think about my home state of Louisiana, where Gannett owns five newspapers in Shreveport, Monroe, Alexandria, Opelousas, and Lafayette. I grew up reading the Lafayette Daily Advertiser. That was what I read every day. Um, just an idea of what's happened to those, those five newspapers. I tracked it once. It would take eight hours to drive between them all. They have one publisher that they share between them. The copy desk and the design and the layout of the paper all happens in Tennessee. That's all been moved away. Um, they don't have any national news because they, of course, they're owned by Gannett, so the USA Today provides a national news section, which is inserted, which is consistent for every Gannett newspaper. Um, I remember the Advertiser as a paper that had a, a fairly substantial staff back when newspapers just made money the minute they rolled out of bed. Um, now it has 11 reporters covering a metro area of 600,000 people, three of those sports. Um, in a real sense, the papers have sort of, these papers have sort of become nameplates that have largely undifferentiated content uh, sort of underneath them. This is already happening. You have something like, you know, the New York Times, which is uh, deciding to expand internationally. Makes perfect sense for them. But at the same time, cutting their, their staff covering the arts in New York and surrounding areas. Um, again, a very reasonable business decision, but one that nonetheless... Um, is a little bit sad. The, uh, the broader trend here is that some, there was a hope some years ago that the move to digital might help distribute journalistic resources more broadly, right? I mean, magazines have always been just centered in, in New York City, but newspapers have been evenly distributed around the country. Every city had one. There were great newsrooms in every, just about every city of any sort of size around the country. Um, what's happened with digital is that's all been concentrated into New York and to a lesser extent, DC and LA and San Francisco. I did analysis looking at, uh, at job listings at journalismjobs.com. 10% of the television and newspaper job listings nationwide were in New York or DC, but over 40% of the digital job listings were in New York or DC. You may remember we just went through an election. Um, questions about sort of the coast not paying attention to the center of the country that may have played some sort of a factor. Aside from the fact that New York and DC are very expensive places to live, and that means that certain kinds of people can have those jobs and other kinds of people cannot. We had, there are very few of these technology companies that have an explicit interest in local journalism. Snapchat was one, but they cut their local stories product this year. Are there any signs of hope? Eh. Um, <laughs> I can, I've shown this slide before because I continue to have some hope uh, in WCPO in Cincinnati, not WKRP in Cincinnati. Um, WCPO is a, a Scripps-owned uh, television station that has decided, why don't we become the dominant digital newsroom in town? Uh, a typical television uh, newsroom in, its, in a market its size would have about six or seven digital staff. They have 35. They have reporters who cover City Hall. They have a paywall. 
You pay ten dollars a month, and you get access to some some of the some good in depth reporting on City Hall. They they're basically betting. Wait, we have a business model. It's called television. Why don't we use that as our movement into uh, maintaining some sort of strength in digital journalism? It's unclear how well it's working out. They've been doing it for a couple years now, and Scripps has not duplicated it into other markets, so that maybe tells you something. But nonetheless, they uh, launched a little newspaper war this earlier this year, which was very amusing to observe. You also do have some digital upstarts. These are three that, aside from sharing a color scheme, which I think means they all work for Soros or something, I'm not sure, are three that do interesting work. Uh, Billy Penn, which in Philadelphia, owned by Spirited Media, which also owns the Incline in Pittsburgh. The New Tropic in Miami, um, which recently expanded to a Seattle site called the Evergrey. And Charlotte Agenda in Charlotte, North Carolina, which uh, recently expanded to Raleigh, and then a week ago decided not to expand to Raleigh anymore because it wasn't working out. Uh, if you go look at these sites, you will find that they share a number of characteristics. They are heavily events-driven. They are not trying to aim for, for page view scale. They have really good newsletter products. They consider that a very core part of what they do. Uh, Charlotte Agenda, one of, one of their most important platforms is Instagram because they found there was no interesting newsy Instagram in Charlotte that gave you a sort of sense of the city. Um, they will have a certain share of what 10 best burritos in Charlotte kinds of stories, but they also do some a little bit of more interesting work. Um, so these are folks that I'm watching uh, going forward and wishing the best. All right. I'm going a little bit long, so I will speed up. Uh, podcasting's boom continues. I love podcasts. You guys love podcasts? They're great. Um, podcast did really well this year. A few specific things. You, did, you have seen an interesting movement in the direction of short-form podcasts. This is an app called 60DB, started by Steve Henn, formerly of Public Radio. Uh, they had just announced today that 70% of the engagement on the app is with stories that are less than 10 minutes long. Podcasts often are, a short podcast is 30 minutes, right? Or an hour or 90 minutes. They, they tend to stretch out. There's something about creating a radio-like experience that I think is an area that podcasting is, is, might be moving towards. I think we're going to see a very significant player announcing soon a daily news podcast that I'm very interested in. Um, this I just thought was an interesting tweet. In a, in a very real sense, uh, when we create new platforms, we're also taking along the biases and problems of other platforms. True crime podcasts, huge success. Uh, just like women, like young white women who've been murdered or has been a, a new success for other platforms before it. Um, cable television news to, to name one. And, and we do have this really interesting move towards walled gardens. The, it's not just the open platform of RSS feeds and podcasts going through iTunes or through a direct podcast player. You're seeing companies like ACAST and 60DB and NPR One all working creating their own closed information ecosystems, which have a variety of problems, but also provide you with amazing data that allow people to recommend re podcasts and podcast episodes to people. It does create a better experience in a lot of ways, even though it sort of goes against, you know, it, it's in a real weird sense, it's sort of replicating the move from blogs to Facebook, right? Open platform everyone has access to, to a platform that increases the ease of use, increases the algorithmic strength, uh, your, your friends are on it, um, and there's a trade-off. Eric Newsom, who works at uh, Audible, put this in his prediction this week, that uh, I think in this year, he th next year, we're gonna see a, a, plat a, a, plat a uh, tiering, essentially, of the po podcast industry and that the professional ones are gonna to try to be moving outside of the RSS iTunes ecosystem as much as possible, and that will make them seem less and less like podcasters. Quick grab bag, richer push notifications. I don't mean richer like the rich people we were talking about before, but uh, the iPhone and iOS 10 adding the ability to, play, to put video and put pictures and other things into push notifications has been something that a lot of people have been very interested in. Uh, I think a previous uh, Studio 20 alum who works at the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab has done some interesting work around this. Um, but that also means that you have things like this. Uh, because Mike likes to send photos, they often send photos to my Apple Watches like, hey, there are buses. <laughs> Breaking news, stop your day, buses exist. Uh, we had some app funerals. I was very sad to see Breaking News get murdered by NBC earlier this week. An app that had 10,000, or 10 million, excuse me, Twitter follows 10,000, and all right, kill it off. Um, and was one of the primary innovators in push notifications and mobile news display. NYT Now officially kicked the bucket this year. The Times of London had an international facing app that was very interesting that also got killed. 
Uh, the Prime bundle in Amazon keeps creeping bigger and bigger. This year we saw magazines be added to the Amazon Prime bundle. If you are have a Prime member, you can go read a bunch of magazines. They'll be in terrible PDF format on your phone, so you really don't want to. But nonetheless, the idea is there. Um, we also saw Audible having a podcast product or podcast-like product called Channels, which was previously a pay product. Now it's available to Prime members. I mention this because the Washington Post owned by Jeff Bezos, has a role in Prime, but it still is a six-month free offer, and then you have to pay for it after that. Wouldn't be shocking for Jeff Bezos to say, you know what, I don't really need those that member that, that uh, subscription money. Amazon Prime, free Washington Post for life, as long as you keep paying your 99 bucks a year. As, uh, as my friend Nick says, eventually the Bezos comes for us all. Um, HBR, uh, however, Business Review doing some interesting work around killing print issues and creating issue-like experiences on the web. Go read the Neiman Lab post about this. Uh, the Associated Press, I have a picture of a robot in every, every time I come here because robots are fun. Um, the Associated Press this year is trying to automate the move from print stories to broadcast stories, right? If anyone who's written broadcast scripts knows that they have different qualities, the language is different, the sentence length is different, they're trying to figure out a way if you could feed a regular a print AP story into a machine and spit out a broadcast story, which is very interesting. Washington Post, it's mentioned things about refocusing attention. If the Post sees that you're reading a story and you, they think you're getting bored, they'll say, hey, 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 shiny thing, come over here, look, look. <laughs> Um, if you're reading a long story uh, on certain stories, they will see that you're not making progress and say, hey, I know this is a long story. Can we send you an email and remind you exactly where you are? You can come back later. I know that we wrote this way too long. Uh, the Panama Papers, collaboration at a massive scale. There have always been, inter uh, well, there haven't always. Recently, there have been a lot of Pan International uh, collaboration projects, but this was over 400 journalists at dozens of different news organizations creating custom tools to give people access to the document core of the, the project. Really a remarkable effort. Nuzzle, my app of the year. All right, a few fans here. Uh, Nuzzle is basically Twitter without all the people on Twitter. <laughs> If that doesn't sell it for you, I don't know what will. Uh, uh, we saw a little boomlet in service journalism, the wire cutter being bought by the New York Times. Uh, you can go look up their model, but basically affiliate fees and promising, we will give you the absolute best recommendation. We will put in many tens of hours of work to tell you exactly what food processor to buy. It's essentially the consumer reports model, but instead of subscribing to consumer reports, they'll happily take a cut of your purchase price of your food processor. And it's a, an interesting model that has built a lot of loyalty. David Ferentholt, the Washington Post, aside from the reporting, set aside the reporting, just his social engagement strategy of posting tweets of a notepad where he's been writing down all the Trump, uh, Trump alleged charities that he's been calling to try and pursue this. This is a story that it would have been very easy to be lost in the weeds, but his social media strategy built up this enormous following and kept that story alive like nothing else could. And I also really liked uh, the skim, the remarkable newsletter. Some people like it, some people, people don't. But um, when they decided we we're going to come up with an app product, it was not just an app product. It was an app product that integrated with your calendar. Thinking about where do people spend time? They spend time in their calendars. How can we continue to provide a service to our readers? I know we can tell them about things that are coming up, inject that into their calendar, and become part of their day every day. Oh, there was an election too. Now this guy, Joe Chandler, Guy who, as of like two weeks after the election, was proud of the fact that he did not know who won and was walking around his Georgia small town looking like a fool. I looked for a more recent update. I haven't found one since like November 20th. So if you see that guy, go up and tell him Trump won. So yeah, Trump, that guy. We won't, I won't go into too much detail here because you've heard enough about Trump and the media. Just a couple quick points. Um, I did think it was remarkable. This is Dean McKay, of course, the executive of the New York Times, uh, in an interview with our Ken Doctor, saying that essentially we at the New York Times were not good at saying something was false. And Trump has essentially taught us to say when things are false. I think there are a lot of people who would have a lot of other critiques of the New York Times coverage, but nonetheless, I think that's a worthwhile thing since the Times is a leader in a lot of journalism trends people follow. Um, we, of course, saw also the victory of digital targeting. The Trump campaign spent just as much money on Facebook and Google ads as they did on television ads. Nothing like that has ever happened before, and that does seem like a very big change. And also part of the larger story we were talking about before, media companies losing advertising to Facebook because they have better data. 
And then there's fake news. You've heard enough about fake news. I was uh, uh, smart enough, I guess, dumb enough, I guess, I don't know. Before the election, I decided I got to see someone who's living in this, in this universe. So I looked at my small town in Louisiana where I grew up and I looked at the mayor, a man I've never met. I've never named him. I don't know if he knows anything that I've been like ragging on him to international media for the last month. <laughs> but on the, within the 48 hours before the campaign, he posted Hillary Clinton calling for civil war. If Trump is elected, Pope Francis shocks the world, endorses Donald Trump. Barack Obama admits he was born in Kenya. The FBI agent who was suspected of leaking Hillary's corruption is dead. This is the mayor of the town I grew up in. I went back to check on him uh, yesterday just to see what he was up to now, what crazy lies he's believing now. And uh, he had posted like 12 very graphic videos of oral surgery. I was like, does he know I'm checking out his Facebook page? Is he trolling me? Maybe he is, I don't know. Um, fake news is a, very, is a uniquely digital problem. Obviously, fake news in various forms existed before. I have, I'm obliged as a pundit to tell you that. You know that. But it, it relies on the dislocation of the two parts of, the, of what used to be the audience accumulation strategy. For If you ran a newspaper, you ran a magazine, you had to build an audience. And then you had to build relationships with advertisers who wanted to reach your audience. Online, you only have to do one. You can rely on ad networks to sell all the ads. These Macedonian teenagers who were busy making up these lies to try and make money off of, off of advertising, they weren't going to Procter & Gamble and say, we have a great place for you to advertise Tide, whatever. They instead were relying on Google and ad networks to, to do that for them. And that, that fracturing of that relationship is, I think, important. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is um, we're very interested in, in this issue going forward and the framework that I've been working with, and I'm still thinking about this, so this might not make any sense, is how do you think about these people, not in just sort of black and white sense of who are these gullible people who think that Donald Trump was endorsed by the Pope. Instead, think about them as the unused. And I mean that in the sense of, are you familiar with the term the unbanked? Right? So the unbanked is a term that can mean a variety of things, but basically means people who do not use or access traditional banking services. They don't have a checking account. They don't have a savings account. Right? And there are lots of those people. 17 million people, in, in, uh, adults in the United States, are unbanked. And they rely on places like check cashing centers right? and prepaid debit cards and things like that. And I think that there is a sense in which the reality of the unbanked is similar to the reality of the unused. So I, there's a lot of interesting research around it. What's, why do people say they are unbanked? They, a lot of them say they, didn't, they don't feel they have enough money to require a bank service, which means they never develop a credit record, which means that they have trouble getting more money. According to a Pew study, one third of the households that left banks did so because they had unexpected or unexplained fees. Uh, check cashing centers are transparent about all their fees. They state them right up front. It's not a confusing environment. Um, only 39% of, of checking accounts were free in 2011, down from 76% just two years earlier. The banking industry was finding ways to add more fees, make the experience more costly. Uh, over, overdraft fees alone now are larger than the entire check cashing industry, just the overdraft fees, right? Say people said they had a lack of knowledge about how the banking system worked. Age is a factor. Younger people are half of young people don't have have traditional banking. It's sometimes the default option for unemployed people because state unemployment benefits come on prepaid debit cards in a lot of states. Um, about six percent of the unbanked actually quit their existing banks because they had a bad customer service experience. They say that check cashing centers are more service oriented. They have more personal relationships with the staff. I just say all this because I think there are a lot of connections there to why people don't want to read the news organizations that you guys work for, right? They don't feel that the news has an impact on them. They find the experience of, consume, of consuming news confusing, sometimes because we write in confusing ways, sometimes because reality is confusing, sometimes we provide a really bad user experience. Young people don't have an investment in creating these habits. They rely on their default option, which for a lot of people is just Facebook and the algorithmic power there within. And the argument for consuming news is not clear to people. If you look at, you know, I, I always come back to Anthony Downs, the economist, who said there are four types of information needs. And I won't list them all because I'm already over time. But uh, the key point is if you want to read reviews on whether to buy a car or not, you consume information and there's a return on your investment. If you're a, a banker and you read the Wall Street Journal, you're going to be smarter. There's going to be a return on your investment. Voting information, there is no return on your investment chance that you are going to be the one person who decides a national election is almost zero. 
even in the close, this very close election, it was still 70,000 people. So people don't have the incentive to consume news unless you explain it to them. And I think that in a lot of cases, people like these guys, fake news providers, are often doing a better job of explaining why you should consume news than the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or your local daily. When these guys were profiled as being fake news people in the Post, they, uh, they decided to write a fake news story back at the Washington Post and distribute it to their millions of Facebook followers about how the Washington Post was fake news. And just a few lines from it. You know it's a sad day in America when small newspapers are being brutally and unnecessarily attacked by bigger papers just because people don't trust them anymore. So they delineated a clear enemy. It's completely black and white. They're appealing to underdogs uh, in the face of elites. Our readers know firsthand that we do not peddle conspiracy theories. We present facts to an audience who the Washington Post apparently thinks is too dumb to think for themselves. They're again reinforcing the intelligence of the reader. Uh, they say, you know us. You know us. You know what we do. We have a connection with us. And in the end, after saying what I, I care about stopping this, these insane attacks, if you agree, help share this story out so we can expose their lies. They are providing a clear call to action that is designed for the context in which that information is being consumed. They have built a news product, news in several layers of scare quotes, that is effective in a lot of ways that real news is not effective. My takeaway from this year is that the range of potential outcomes is much wider than you think. I, for one, I can't speak for all of you, maybe you were all seers, I sure as hell did not think Donald Trump was gonna be our president. Uh, I thought that was outside the realm of possibility. So the thing I'm taking in 2017 is that whatever you think the range of potential outcomes is, add a few layers outside of it, because that sort of thing can happen. All right, that's it. Excellent. Josh, thank you so much. We really appreciate you doing this every year.